here. And if I have a 1, I double it and add 1, which moves me. 2 plus 1 is 3, back to here. From 2, if I get a 0, I double it. And if I get a 1, you all know I stay where I am. And there's beautiful symmetry in this uh, example. And here is the final state. Not divisible by 3 is here and here. This or that. This brings up another difficulty with reversing a machine. Where would my start state be if I, re if I reverse this machine? It could be either here or here. Right? So we have to be really careful with this reverse idea. There's, there's a couple issues that will, that will come up. OK, questions about this? We're done with examples. Brian, I, yeah? I wonder if you mean something stronger, like it has to be either there or there, as opposed to just you could start it at one of the two places and that would be good enough. Uh, it, ha it has to be either this one or this one, but not any other place. Right, the way to really make this reverse is to do something like this. Have a start state here. Get rid of these final states here. And say you can go to here or to here without seeing anything. See these strange transitions? These are called E transitions, or E moves, or lambda moves. And they also make a machine non-deterministic, because you don't know what it's going to do. So there's lots of ways to make a machine non-deterministic. Double zeros or ones coming out of a state, or adding what are called E moves. And we're going to find out in a little while, before the day is over, that, uh, that adding these things actually doesn't give you any more power. I could take any machine like this and convert it back to a deterministic machine and not have all these funny duplicates. And that's a nice thing to know, because it lets you use these things at will with, without thinking you've gone out of your uh, universe. OK, let's take a, a, a two-minute brain break for a second and think about something else without, the, without these examples. Uh, we did a whole bunch of examples of things that are accepted by finite state machines. So. I told you some things that aren't accepted by finite state machines, but let's try to come up with some simple things that aren't accepted by finite state machines. Can you think of anything that you'd have a hard time doing? And the reason I'm asking you this is because you're not going to be able to appreciate moving up to this level and this level if you think pretty much you could do everything with just this. Why have unbounded memory if you just need finite memory? I mean, why make up a Turing machine if this represents a computer? This doesn't. This is limited. This is a computer with half its brain cut out. All right, so what kind of strings can't we accept with a finite state machine that are, that are easier to describe than just Java programs? And even Java programs, nobody could convince me there's no way to do it. I mean, I believe you, but, but it's not like you tried every finite state machine in the world. Are we still talking uniquely yes, no answers? Yes, just uniquely yes, no answers. So there's a famous one. Uh, Think about what you can't do in finite state machines. What you can't really do in finite state machines is count. Mm -hmm. The simplest thing that you can't do. You can't count to an arbitrary number. Here you can go up to three. You're looking for substrings. You can go up to the length of the substring. You're looking for finite conditions. After a zero, there's two ones. You count a finite number of things. Think of any set of strings you can think of that requires you requires in quotes here, because we haven't proved that it's required, but that intuitively seems to need counting. Anybody come up with one? If you read it in the book, you can just tell me. That's OK, too. So the largest number of zeros after a 1 or something, any of those would require counting? OK, so what do you mean the largest number so of zeros? That's not a yes or no question. Yeah, I need to have like a, a condition. Is something a Fibonacci number? OK, so the binary numbers that are Fibonacci numbers, uh, I'm pretty sure that's not a finite state machine. It'd be hard to, because it looks like we need some kind of arithmetic calculation. That's a good example. Equal Other example. Equal number of zeros and ones. Uh, that's a, another very good example. For certain, there's no finite state machine that will just count the zeros and ones and tell you if they're equal. Uh, and even, even simpler than that, even this, this. Even if all the zeros come first and the ones come at the end. You know, so that means E and 0, 1 and 0, 0, 1, 1. This set, dot, dot, dot. 
This set there's no finite state machine for. Well, how do I convince you of this except send you home, ask you to try, and when you try all night and, and all 30 of you don't come up with it, I'll say, well, that's 30 more people who haven't come up with it. Right? So I'll keep doing this until I die, and then sooner or later I'll teach 4,000 people, and when I hit 5,000, we've proved it. Right? We need a better proof, and there's a really wonderful proof that there are sets that are not acceptable by finite state machines, but it comes up with a very abstract kind of cool set. And um, we'll try to get to that. I don't know if we'll get to it today, probably in a lecture or two. It's a really neat thing because it's used over and over again at the higher levels. And that proof technique is called diagonalization. We'll go through it in very de great detail. It's a really neat idea. But for finite state machines, there's an even easier method of proof that even strings as simple as this can't be done. And this proof is going to be very constructive. This proof is going to be, I'm going to have a discussion with you guys in class. I say, I challenge you to do this. You say, I'll do it. I ask you a question about what you supposedly did. You give me an answer. I ask you another question. You give me an answer. And I nail you down and convince you that you lied somewhere along the way, if there really was a way to do this. So the proofs in general in this course are very constructive. They don't at all you know, involve too much. Uh, it looks like they do if you look at the book. But they don't involve a lot of deep, deep difficult mathematics. They involve a lot of logic and a lot of straightforward argument. And we'll get to those proofs later. Did he call it a Turing machine, or did he call it something else when he first named it? You know, I can't imagine that he called it a Turing machine. Uh, I did read the paper, and I'm pretty sure he didn't. But, but I don't know for sure. I'm pretty sure he didn't. He was a modest guy. He, he <laughs> I remember. Well, for <laughs> I remember something somebody said last month about somebody naming something after themselves, but now I forgot what it was. <laughs> it's, it's slipping my memory. It's slipping my mind. All right. Uh, next step. What I want to do now is, is talk about the issues that have been brought up intuitively twice already. One is when you have a machine that has more than one choice, a non-deterministic machine, what does that mean? And once we determine what it means, does it give us power in describing these sets more easily? And then how can we convince ourselves that it actually doesn't give us any more power as far as what sets we can compute, but just in the sense of how easy it is for us to realize that we can compute them? So it doesn't really give us any more power. It doesn't let us compute anything we couldn't compute before. But we end up realizing that we can compute things faster than we used to realize it because we have a more powerful tool. It's the equivalent with you learn machine language as your first programming language. And you understand programming through that, and you completely can program anything. And then somebody teaches you scheme. And you go, woo, well now it's a lot easier to do recursion. And everybody goes, well, yes it is. And things are much easier. But there wasn't anything you couldn't do with machine language that you can do with scheme. It's just a lot easier to use scheme. They're equivalent in power. They're just not equivalent as far as ease of use. That's what's going to happen here. If we tack on non-determinism to a finite state machine, they're equivalent power, but one is much easier to use. So here's non-determinism used to save us a lot of time. Let's do that same example, strings that contain 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. And let's make a non-deterministic machine. Before we even say what a non-deterministic machine really is, let's make one up. And by doing this, it'll motivate what it is, and then I'll explain it. So here's a fast machine to accept 110110. Somewhere in this string, if we're going to accept it, there's an occurrence of 110110. I don't know where that is. So I will read a whole bunch of symbols, zeros and ones, until I get up to the beginning of that string. And when I do, I will read that string. 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. And then I will accept. Well, that's it. So you're thinking, well, that's cheating. <laughs> right? Well, it's cheating. So we have to decide what this means, give it a rigorous definition as to what this strange machine really accepts. I'll convince you after we give a rigorous definition that this machine really does accept exactly strings containing 110110, and then convince you that we can turn these machines into regular deterministic machines. And when we're all done, it would look like that other complicated one I had on the board that has just a single 0, 1 coming out of every circle. So what's that process for converting it? 